Okay, I invite you to turn your Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes. We kicked off the uh, introductory portion of the book, and then I got sick, and now I'm back. And for those of you who are watching by the millions over television, <laughs> thankfully I am improved. So we're going to break in at verse 12 and cover a lot of material Actually, you can make a correction at the top of your page, two corrections while we're doing corrections. And I'm going to go all the way through chapter 2, that's verse 26. Obviously, I can't read all that and comment verse by verse, but I'm going to give you the big picture. And uh, also, if you move down under Roman numeral 1 in the first paragraph there, the reference is 113 instead of 213. So if you'll correct that, then the corrections will be made and... <clears throat> I just want to read a little bit here in uh, beginning at verse 12. I, the preacher, I, Koheleth, or the, the one who gathers, the assembler, I just kind of like the preacher. If I'd been translating, I'd just put Solomon. In spite of the uh, debates over who wrote it, I think Solomon did. But I, the preacher, and that's Solomon in my humble opinion, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. And I applied my heart, notice, to seek and search out wisdom, search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. Boy, talking about an undertaking. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of men to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after the wind, or as one translation says, chasing after the wind. Now here's the problem, verse 15. What is crooked cannot be made straight. Now let me, let me try to straighten that out. <laughs> crooked in the sense of inscrutable. It's not crooked in the sense of corrupt or wicked. What he means is it's been made crooked and you can't figure it out. From under the sun, you're not going to figure it out. And we'll comment a little bit more on that later. What is lacking cannot be counted. And then we'll pick up later, uh, just as a general scanning overview of these other verses. I've, I've titled this teaching, Living More But Enjoying It Less. <clears throat> Some of you can remember back in the days when cigarette advertisements were allowed. And one, one advertiser said, are you smoking more but enjoying it less? Now, if you transpose that question onto modern man's lifestyle, I, I think we'd have to conclude that never in human history have so many traveled so much, so far, toured, tasted, viewed, experienced, and yet, in spite of all that, only enjoy it less and less. But, before diving any further in this book, I, I want to set forth a correction that I believe causes many to view this book as nihilistic or nihilistic, depressing, and devoid of hope. And the challenge is to get the purpose of the writing correct from the start. I think translations like the NIV tend to mislead from the very outset because if you look back up to verse 2 in chapter 1 of Ecclesiastes. Here's how the NIV translates it. Meaningless. Meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Now, now again, in my opinion, this translation lends support to the modern existential assertion that all of life is nothing. It's just absolutely meaningless. And Pastor Doug Wilson, in his notes, said in his book, <clears throat> a course from beginning to end, including Ecclesiastes in the middle of the Bible, it rejects this area, era. In other words, that, that's not in the Bible. Even Ecclesiastes, that's not what it's about. And further, if Solomon were arguing the absolute meaningless of absolutely everything, then why would he trust his argument? If everything is meaningless, then what he's saying is meaningless, Right? That's like people who say there's no such thing as absolute truth. Well, is what you just said absolute truth? 
So it's self-refuting. It can't, that, that can't be. So how could anything or any word mean utter meaningless? You following, the, following, following what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, so whenever anyone announces that there's no such thing as truth or there's, everything is meaningless, then there, there's no meaning to what they just said. But Solomon is a wiser man to fall, than to fall into the idiocy of modern existential relativism. Existentialism simply means individual experience. Whatever you make of it, that's it. Nothing beyond. One of the key words, again, in this book is vanity. And it does not mean final, ultimate absurdity. It refers to the fleeting nature of life, like a vapor of breath on a cold morning. And is gone. Like chasing the wind. You reach for it, you feel it, you sense it, but there's nothing to hold on to. So here's the first big idea. The persistent search for personal satisfaction. So Solomon sets himself a huge project of exploration. Look at verse 13 again, chapter 1. All that is done under the heavens. Now, now let, let's suppose that you're at a place in your education where you want to get a PhD and you go before your professor and he asks you what your research topic is going to be, topic is going to be and you say, all things done under heaven. <laughs> Seriously? All things done under heaven. Notice how he states his immediate and preliminary negative observation in verses 13b through 15. What an unhappy business, ESV says. NIV says, what a, happy, what a heavy burden. The, the, uh, the, the King James says, sore travail. So, but the Hebrew word is ra, meaning a business or task that is bad or evil. Now, this is an astonishing bleak assessment that God created the world good and that work itself is a good thing, which Solomon is going to repeat continually uh, over and over throughout the book. Yet here... He pronounces the whole human enterprise bad, and guess what? Who does he blame? God. It is God who has given this heavy, evil, unhappy business to humanity. It is God who lays this burden of frustrating, meaningless work on our shoulders. So immediately then, we can see that he's not excluding God from his research or equations. So that means when you look at life under the sun, it doesn't mean that he's excluding God altogether. God is, in fact, very much involved in all the processes, events, situations, and outcomes that he'll explore. Now let me just do a brief aside. Solomon mentions God 40 times in the book of Ecclesiastes, and he always uses the Hebrew word Elohim and never Yahweh or Jehovah. Elohim is... It's translated God in the English Bible is the mighty God, the glorious God of creation who exercises sovereign power. Yahweh or Jehovah, which is always all uppercase, capitals, L-O-R-D in the English Bible, is the God of the covenant, the God of revelation, who is eternally self-existent and graciously relates himself to sinful man through covenant. Since Solomon is dealing exclusively with what he sees under the sun, he only uses the word Elohim, or God. But, far from that conviction solving anything, he can only conclude that God has somehow implicated in the way human life is such a heavy burden, and all human accomplishments seem to be ultimately as frustrating as chasing the wind. It's all God's fault. <laughs> Now you're ready to argue and say, well, no. But listen to this. Again, quoting from Pastor Doug Wilson. He said, the fool sets about straightening the crooked, but Solomon, eyes open, saw that the crooked cannot be straightened out. Verse 15. What is crooked cannot be made straight. And why not? And looking ahead, we see that it's because God is the one who made it crooked. Here's what Ecclesiastes 7.13 says. Consider the work of God who can make straight what he's made crooked. And again, crooked in the sense of making it inscrutable. You can't figure it out. And again, here's the amazing thing. There was a television series entitled How the Universe Works. 
give me a break. A little peep brain frail creature of Gus is going to tell me how the whole universe works. There's another called Toe, the theory of everything. Like you, you got a, you got it all figured out, a theory of everything. So uh, there, there's a purpose behind this meaningless or this vanity. It's the purpose and intent of God that sinners cannot straighten out what he made crooked. And again, to continue with a quote from Doug Wilson, a popular notion is about that God is above all this crooked mess down here, wringing his hands over a world gone bad. So whenever some public calamity befalls us, some soupy minister is bound to get some airtime assuring all that, quote, God's heart was the first to break. This let's keep God away from responsibility for the bad stuff theology seeks in a superficial way to defend the honor of God. If God is not really here, then we cannot blame him for the problem of evil. And so we reason to ourselves, thinking, thinking that man by his free will has made something crooked which God cannot for various reasons straighten out. And the problem with this idea is that Solomon states it exactly the other way. Man cannot straighten out what God has made crooked. And since the fall of Adam in the Garden of Eden, there, the whole creation has been subject to futility. Romans 8.20 It's been subject to futility. It's not working the way it should be. It's not working the, thing, the way you think it ought to be. And the bad news is you can't straighten it out. This idiocy called climate change and changing the, changing the whole world is, is nothing more than idiocy. It's chasing the wind. It's vanity. You can't change it. We can make some difference, but one volcanic eruption in one place can change the whole world for centuries to come. And you can't do one thing about it. So, man cannot straighten out what God's made crooked. Uh, we like to think that God, quote, doesn't do earthquakes or hurricanes or anything bad. We assure an unbelieving world that we do not serve a God who, will, who wields natural disasters or any other kind of disaster. Well, the problem with that is you haven't read the Old Testament lately. We have only one tiny problem, one tiny problem with this thesis. Shall there be evil in a city and the Lord hath not done it? Amos 3, 6. You say, you mean, I mean it. What I mean is this. I mean, I don't attempt to explain anything. I don't attempt to explain who did this. Did the devil do this? Did God do this? Did man do this? There is a God who is large and in charge. The Bible teaches that God is sovereign. And however you define that, if you define it anything less than God determines and destines, it predestines all things, then you have issues with the Bible in my humble and accurate opinion, and you have issues with me, and there's no need even coming to me because you're not going to get anywhere with me because I have a totally 100% unteachable spirit when it comes to the sovereignty of God. And my favorite statement is, listen, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't have, I, I don't know half as much as I thought I once knew. And, and I'm, I'm half unsure about half the things that I do know. But I do know this. God is sovereign. He's large. He's in charge. He's good. He's great. He's glorious. And he's working all things together for his glory and the good of his elect people. Amen? Amen. Okay. So, again, if you have questions about that, don't ask. We won't go there. So within these boundaries, wisdom can only show that God is determined to trap us in a meaning of his existence. So any intelligent investigation of the world and its pleasures will only multiply sorrows. Look at verse 18. He said in verse 18, For in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. In other words, the more you know about what you know and what you see just from under the sun, sometimes you'd think you'd be better off not to know much at all. Again, that's not to put that's not to put make ignorance bliss. If that were true, most of us would be in a blissful state. <coughs> so any intelligent investigation of the world and its pleasures, as I said, only multiplies sorrows. 
The fool thinks he's chained to a dungeon wall. The intelligent knows that it's actually a labyrinth, a maze. Pleasures, delights, sensations, and all their cousins will only send a man first on the fool's errands and then on that one and another one after that. And one last time to quote Doug Wilson. He says, the descent into hell begins. Solomon had, had set himself to a particular task, that of figuring it all out. Chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. He, seeks, he sets his heart to seek, verse 13. He communed with his heart on the subject, verse 16. He sets his heart to know, verse 17. And this is the testimony of his descent into madness and folly. Look, look at verse 12 of chapter 2. So I turned to consider wisdom and madness and folly. Let me correct one more thought here, one more idea. When he talks about madness or insanity and folly, he's not talking about he's not talking about mental oddity. He's not talking about mental issues. He's talking about moral perversity. He's not talking about insanity. He's talking about iniquity. And so you need to keep that in mind as we continue to unfold these uh, these uh, points that he's going to make. So, he, he, here's again the last quote from Doug. He fell away from God with his eyes open, looking around himself the while. The whole investigation was a sorry business, producing sorry results. And that's the end of the quote. So, off we go. Was the wisest man that ever lived apart from Jesus on a wild goose chase for meaning in life under the sun. If I had another title, I would say, let the good times roll. <laughs> let the good times roll. Verses 1 through 8. In chapter 2, verses 2 through 8, he lists all the pleasures that he's tried. Then in verses 9 through 11, he gives by personal reflection what he's learned from all that. So we're just going to pass over it very quickly. First of all, he tried higher education. That's back in verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 13 through 18. 16, he says, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my heart had a great experience of wisdom and knowledge. So he tried higher education. He tried learning. British author Malcolm Muggeridge said, and, and I agree. Education is a great mumbo jumbo fraud of the age because it purports to equip us to live and is prescribed as a universal remedy from everything from juvenile delinquency to premature senility. And so he tried learning, higher education. He tried personal experimentation. Look at chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. I said in my heart, come now, I'll test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity, a chasing of the wind, like a vapor out of your mouth on a cold morning. I said of laughter, it is mad and of pleasure. What use is it? So he tried laughter. His attitude was maybe the clown is better off than the clever man. And I think his conclusion was, expressed in a popular song of years gone by. Old folks like you and me can remember that. It went something like this. Although I laugh and act like a clown beneath this mask, I am wearing a frown. How many of you ever remember that song? Not at all. Nelson. I can't think of his first name, but his last name was Nelson. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mikey. I, I know where you've been a part of your life. <laughs> <laughs> same Ricky, place. Ricky same Nelson. with me, <laughs> Ricky Nelson. Ricky. Although I laugh and act like a clown beneath this mask, I'm wearing a frown. Uh, we, there, there's a place for comedy, but it's a little place. He tried laughter. Notice he next he tried liquor. He said, uh, what he's actually saying is, was, is there a drug that can bring instant lasting happiness and satisfaction? Now, don't misunderstand. He didn't become a drunken sot, but a connoisseur of fine wines. How do I know? Because he used his mind. And if you get drunk enough, you don't use your mind. <laughs> he, he said, I search with my heart how to cheer my body. My heart still guiding me with wisdom. So he, didn't, he just didn't stay drunk all the time. Don't learn anything there. He tried laughter. He tried liquor. Then he tried lust. 
Drop down to verse 8. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces, got singers, both men and women, many concubines, the delight of the children of man. Now listen to this passage from 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 3 and 4. He had 700 wives who were princesses. In other words, this cream of the crop. This is not just average run-of-the-mill, so ugly you have to slip up on the dipper to get a drink type of... But these are these are cream of the crop and three hundred cu- concubines. I want to say what the little boys said: three hundred cucumber vines, seven hundred wives, and three hundred concubines. Now, for me, that's an immediate prescription for trouble. A, a thousand times trouble. I'm sorry, ladies. You'd agree as well. If you had seven, you had a thousand rivals, and his wives. Here's what King says: His wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wife turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. How sad! So Solomon tried wine, women, and song, but he found his like the experience of the poet who wrote. I tried the broken cisterns, Lord, but all the waters fail. Even as I stooped to drink, they fled and mocked me as I wail. Higher education, personal experimentation, scientific exploration. Verses 4 through 6. I made great works. I built houses, planted vineyards for myself, made gardens and parks, and planted them all kind of fruit trees, made pools from which to water the forest, to growing trees. So... He, he, uh, he tried labor, learning, laughter, liquor, lust, labor. There, there were basically two kinds of projects. Number one, agricultural projects. Now, now these, these uh, I mean, a- architectural. There was, our, I, I, I got two before one. Architectural projects. But, but again, these were not public works except for the building of the temple. He did build the temple. It took him seven years to build the temple. You know how long it took him to build his house? Fourteen years. And, and, and his house was not a public works. And, and all these architectural problems basically centered around him and around his, his palatial mansions. And then agricultural projects. We read that. I mean, whatever uh, in uh, uh, the world of agriculture and, and uh, growing of trees, he did it all. And then notice verses 7 and 8, material accumulations. He tried not only labor and lust and liquor and laughter and learning, he tried luxury. And the the, the king says that he made gold and silver as common as stones on the street. I mean, he had uh, amassed a fortune. But it didn't bring satisfaction. Then musical stimulation. Look again in verse 8. He said, I also, I got me singers. And you can bet he didn't spare any expense in the music department. So what that means is he tried listening. Sit there and listen to these singers. Did that bring answers and satisfaction? No. And then public admiration. Look at verse 9. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remain with me. So, uh, this I call public admiration. Listen again. Is that reference in your notes, First, mm-hmm. first Kings? Everyone read that and let me rest my voice. First Kings 10, 23 through 25. Thus, Thus King Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. <laughs> So he tried leadership. I became great, surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem, and also my wisdom remained with me. In other words, he was a he was a world figure. He was known throughout the known world of that time. And, and every Christian should know that things cannot bring satisfaction or happiness. But for many, the poet was right when he said, Ask the rich man, he'll confess, 
Money can't buy happiness. Ask the poor man. He don't doubt that he'd rather be miserable than without. <laughs> right? All right, so there's a persistent search, personal satisfaction, life under the sun. And the conclusion is all is vanity and vexation of spirit. But notice the next big idea, Roman numeral two, the pessimistic summary from actual experimentation. Verse 17 of chapter two. So I hated life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me for all is vanity and a chasing after the wind. Now, let me, let me correct what, what he's not saying. He's not saying I hated life in the sense of utter despair, but ultimate disappointment. This is what I don't like about life. It's not that there's absolute despair and meaningless. It's that there's ultimate disappointment. Just when you think you've got it all figured out and everything is going your way, then sure enough, another way comes along and you're, you're back in the turmoil again. So, it's, uh, uh, l let me get back to my text. And, and before proceeding, let this thought challenge you. If nothing in this world can provide happiness, then does it not stand to reason that you and I were designed for another world? Yes. But let's look quickly at the analysis of the experiment versus... 12 through 23 of chapter 2. It's, it's, too much to, it's too much to read at all. But, but here's what he says. So I turn to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what's already been done. Then I saw that there's no more gain in wisdom than in folly. Then later on he says it's better to, it's better to be smart than stupid. But here's the problem. The same thing happens to the smart and the stupid. What happens to us? Yeah. We die. So Solomon is facing up this situation, seeing his life as it really is. And he, what he wants to convey to us is it's not pretty. Life lived without God at the center is vanity, a chasing of the wind. There's nothing to it. You'll never catch it. Squeeze out all the pleasure you can from any direction you want to go, and there's still nothing to be gained from living under the sun without God as the as a centerpiece of it all, the, the, the hub about which everything else revolves. Pleasure pursued for its own sake does not and cannot satisfy the soul. We're going to learn in chapter 3 that God set eternity in our hearts and nothing except eternity is big enough to fill a heart created for God. So learn this lesson from Ecclesiastes or else learn it from sad experience. Like the woman that Rabbi Harold Kushner writes about in his book, when all you've ever wanted is enough. She married a very successful corporate executive, bought her dream house in the suburbs, but now she, quote, cannot understand why she goes around every morning saying to herself, is this all there is to life? Is this all there is to life? Is this all there is to life? Because here's, let me give you two sums from the summations from the analysis that he gives of the experiment. Number one, verses 12 through 17, death is the great equalizer and is no respecter of persons. Verses 12 through 14, death doesn't recognize the excellence of wisdom. Verse 15, death doesn't respect the desire for wisdom. Verse 16, it doesn't remember the work of wisdom. And number 17, it, verse 17, it doesn't relieve the burden of wisdom. We all step on the treadmill of life without asking to be put there. Nobody asked me if I wanted to be born. If they had, I probably would have said no. <laughs> you, you, got, you got born. You got put on the treadmill of life. And when you get there, you try to outrun death with all of our activity. But guess what? All to no avail. The grim reaper is faster than all of us. He catches us all. And all our new innovations have only allowed us to postpone death for a while longer. And then... Here's the second conclusion. Others will inherit what we've done, verses 18 through 23. We don't know what they'll be like. We don't know if they'll be good stewards or poor stewards. And then verses 20 through 21. Just, just let your eyes just cross that without me taking time to read it. They're going to get what they haven't worked for. You work, you, you sacrifice 
but it's going to be passed on to somebody and they didn't work for what they're getting. And then verses 22 through 23, our struggles and sorrows make no difference. He said, what is a man for all the toil and striving of heart, which he toils beneath the sun? For all of his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. Even in the night, his heart does not rest. This is also vanity. He can't rest because he's work without God being the center, the hub, He's out on a spoke, and out on a spoke, nothing has been balanced. Nothing makes sense. And he's worried to death about what's going to happen with what he's going to leave behind. And the, the, the astounding thing is, he doesn't know when he's going to leave it behind. You see, I look at my life, Lord willing, if I live to be I live to November the 4th, I'll be 76 years old. And I think, okay, the average life expectancy in America is 78 for me, and I think that's gone down a couple of years. So... Let me see, plan for 10 years. I don't, I don't know if I got 10 years or not, but the reality is I don't know if I got 10 seconds or not. See, that's the absurdity of all. I don't, I don't know if I got, neither do you. And, and, and hear me, the American dream is a lie and a failure. Mm -hmm. We live in a culture with more money, more entertainment, more pleasurable experiences, more recreation, and more stuff than any previous generation could ever dreamed of. And pain pills and antidepressants fly over the counters in an unprecedented number. It's a miserable world where one of the funniest and richest men the world has ever seen, Robin Williams, kills himself in despair. And that's just one example. But let's look at the proper solution from biblical revelation. You see, that's what Solomon does. He holds you under until you think you're almost drowned, then he lets you up. And you get a glimpse, at least from Old Testament perspective. The proper solution from biblical revelation. The late Tim Keller makes a great point about what the author of Ecclesiastes is driving his readers to see. And that is that there are only two possible conclusions in life. Either there's a God above with a standard who will judge us at the end based on that standard or life is totally meaningless. <coughs> Excuse me. There are only two options. Either there's a God and our actions have meaning, or there's no God. And as Ernest Hemingway said, life is a dirty trick, a short journey from nothingness to nothingness, and then he goes out and blows his brains out with a shotgun. Keller goes on and states, people think Christians are naive, but if your origin is insignificant and your destiny is insignificant, then have the guts to admit that your life is insignificant. If you came from nothing and you're going from nothing, then what does that make you? Nothing. Why work for human rights or the common good or for justice for all if all is going to be burned up in the end anyway? If we're just accidents heading for annihilation, then nothing we do matters. So that's the reason. I love Ecclesiastes because it's the most pertinent book for our time. When people are trying to say, we can do this. All together we can figure this out. All together we can fix this. We can't fix it. But the good news is God has already applied the fixer and the curse is working itself backward according to C.S. Lewis and his line of Witch in the Wardrobe story. The message of Ecclesiastes isn't that earthly joys are worthless, but they're not ultimate. Hear that, brothers and sisters. It's not that earthly joys are worthless. They're not ultimate. You can't. You can't. No doubt all of us have been in a place, I, I want to freeze life right there. Just let it stay right there. But you know, that's absurd. It can't happen. So you can't try to make something that's temporary and passing ultimate. So someone said, what does it mean to love life and the world if it's passing away? And if I'm meant to enjoy God and live for Christ first and foremost. Let me say that the two things go hand in hand, absolutely beautiful. And for this reason, in the created world, you can only true, truly enjoy what you do not worship, what you do not make an idol of. E anything that you have to check in with God before you obey God or anything, you take a good thing and make it the ultimate thing. That's the heart of idolatry. It's not making a me metal image. It's having a mental image and going out and trying to make something that's temporary, something that was meant to give a moment of temporary pleasure, make it ultimate and try to make your life center around and pursue that, and that's idolatry. So the sum 
And, and he does this, by the way, seven times. Enjoy life. Verse 24. There's nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he's given the business of gathering, collecting, only to give to the one who pleases God. This is also vanity and striving after the wind. So, the fact that Solomon admonishes readers not to look for answer to life and the pleasures of life does not rule out his encouraging them to accept their lot in life and be glad for the simple pleasures of life, like what? Food and work and marriage and doing good and enjoying the moment that you have. Like I said, this theme occurs seven times in the book. Do yourself a favor and read those times. I've listed them in your notes, right? Yeah. Okay, do, do yourself a favor because I don't have time. He's going to repeat this over and over and add different things to it as, as, as it, he unfolds it. These modest pleasures are not goals to live for, but bonuses or consolations to be gratefully accepted. The fact that these pleasures are from man's joy and contentment rules out asceticism. That's a, you've got to deny yourself everything and anything that's good and pleasurable. And also it rules out hedonism. That is, you, that, that you're designed to live for pleasure. In one sense you are, but for the pleasure of God. Your reason for existence is to enjoy God and delight in Him. So when we recognize that no earthly goods are ultimate, then we can stop treating them like they are. Now listen to this sentence. We, when we own the fact that death will take everything from us and take us from everything. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. Death will take everything from us and take us from everything. When that happens, we get that picture. We're free to enjoy life's flickering goods for what they are. God richly provides us with everything to enjoy, Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, 17. The problem ultimately isn't your marriage or lack of it or career or money, but the weight of expectation and longing you invest in them. Only the new creation in Christ is solid enough to bear the full weight of all of our yearning, all of our heart's desire. Only the unobstructed sight of the imperishable God is secure enough to bring us unending happiness. Finally, one of the main reasons why Ecclesiastes is in the Bible is to convince us not to love the world or live for its pleasure. This message is not intended to discourage us or to make us any more depressed than we already are, but to drive us back to God. This is not all there is. There is also a God in heaven who has sent his Son to be our Savior. That Son resisted the pleasures of this life to fulfill the purposes of God for our salvation. Mark Driscoll said, every, Mark Driscoll said everything Solomon pursued, Jesus was tempted by but resisted. So begin to live in light of the certain tragedy of death and the victorious provision of life in Christ alone. Then you'll be free, free to enjoy the craziness of life. Is life crazy? It's crazy. Mm -hmm. It's confusing. You think you've got it figured out? You need to go back and read Ecclesiastes. The wisest man that ever lived didn't get it figured out, and you won't either. When you stop treating this life as if it must satisfy you entirely, hear these words, and I'm finished. When you stop treating this life like it's got to satisfy you entirely, you'll find life more satisfying. Want to live well? Prepare to die by trusting in Christ alone through faith alone. Know that the breath will vanish and the heart will stop for the final time. Despite all that you try to do to prolong it, and when you do that, then you can enjoy the fleeting glory of this world with the guaranteed prospects that you're in something God big, God planned the eternity long, and that there's a new heaven and a new earth in our future, and that will be forever and ever. Amen? Amen. Amen.